and welcome to Pathway Online. We are so excited that you have decided to join us for church today. It is so cool that we get to come together in this way where we get to experience church together. Here at Pathway, we are a family of individuals that have found life in Christ. And we're so excited to share that love with as many people as possible. One of the ways that you can stay connected at home if you're a parent is to go to pathwaycc.net slash parent resources. On there, you will find amazing content to help your kids experience Sunday school at home. I know my kids have really enjoyed watching their Sunday school programs online, and I know yours will too. So let's get into worship and enjoy our time together. breath in our lungs so we pour out 
Giving is an integral act of worship that expresses our gratitude, faith, and love for others. Generosity flows from a belief that all we have, are, or ever will be is not ours to hold on to. It's ours to share because God has shared his wealth with us and we seek to bring glory to God. If you would like to give to Pathway Community Church, here are those four ways that you can give. Online bill payment, e-transfer, you can do your pre-authorized withdrawal, or you can stop by the Pathway office and give your donation in person. For all this information, make sure to visit pathwaycc.net slash give. One of my favorite stories of our family on Janet's side getting together is, uh, is one New Year's Eve. And this one particular New Year's Eve, we got together first thing in the morning, and we got together for waffles with all the trimmings that you could possibly imagine with, with whipped cream and, and syrup and, and fruit and just everything you could think of. It was just an amazing, amazing breakfast. And of course, to top it off, which makes every breakfast better, is we had bacon in there as well. And, and so I remember taking the waffles and, and putting bacon in between these two. It was a bacon waffle sandwich. It was an incredible thing. And I remember after eating it, I was so full. I, I was stuffed. I, I couldn't even really think straight. And you would think that as a family at that point, that because we had eaten so much that we would stop eating. But that was not the case. We continued eating roughly every hour and a half throughout the day. We started with breakfast, with this incredible large breakfast, and then we had these mini meals in between of just snacking, and then we had lunch. I don't even remember what we ate for lunch. I just remember being even more full. And then we had a snack time, and then we had this thing called FOSPA, which was glorious, which is basically a mid-afternoon meal. And then we went into supper, and then after supper, we, of course, had our desserts and all that stuff, and then we had more snacks and more, all the way up until that clock hit midnight. Now, I can tell you that I really was under the influence of food at that point. I didn't want to move. I, I couldn't get up. I couldn't think properly. My stomach felt bloated, but it was wonderful and, and, and just all kinds of things. I was absolutely under the influence of that food. And it had an impact on me, a dramatic impact. I didn't sleep well that night. I don't know how many times I got up and went to the bathroom. I kid you not. It, it was uncomfortable. It was unpleasant. But I still look back on that day and say the influence that I was under Man, I, we still joke about how much we ate that day. It was just nonstop eating, and we were completely influenced by what we were doing. I find that to be an interesting thing, especially as we're considering today this topic of being filled by the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, I would like for you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Now, if you don't know where the book of Ephesians is, I don't want you to worry too much about that. In the beginning of your Bible, there's a table of contents. People work really hard to put it there. Don't be ashamed to use it. Just go ahead and turn there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And when you find it, one of the ways we like to show respect here for God's word at Pathway Community Church is we do like to stand for the reading of his word. So I get it, it's silly, you're in your living room, you're at your computer, you're on your device, on the deck, wherever you are, Would I, can I just get you to stand with us together as we read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Here's what it says. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning, this time that we can be spending here together. Lord, where, whatever time it is that people are tuning into this, I just ask, Lord, that you would show your presence, that they would sense that your desire for them is good, your desire for them is highly, highly relational, 
and that, Jesus, you're just so badly wanting relationship with us that you want us to know that you are present. And so, Lord, that people would experience that. I ask that through the, your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to be people who have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that are open this morning and this time together. Amen. Now, you might be wondering, Rob, why are you talking about food when we're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I think you could probably imagine that we're talking about the idea of when we're filled with something, it has influence over us. In Ephesians chapter 5, before leading up to this portion that we're focused on today, Paul tells us to walk in love. There's all these kinds of instructions on what it means to be a believer and to live out what he calls Christian living. And so we walk in love, we walk in light, we walk carefully. And I want us to know today that, that the thing that he really I want us to see is that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this. And it's not a difficult question, um, but I think that when we reflect on it, it's a question that can probably be a little bit humbling for us. How much control does the Holy Spirit have in your life? And just pause on that for a moment. How much control does the Holy Spirit have in your life? When you think about a driver's seat in a vehicle, are you in the driver's seat? Or is the Holy Spirit in the driver's seat and you're in the passenger seat? Like, where do you sit in the vehicle, in this ride that you're on with God? How much is the Holy Spirit in control in your life? Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul uses alcohol as an example and he says, do not be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you, to, just in case anybody's worried out there, this is not a message. It's not a talk talking about alcohol. It's not what it is. But it is a talk where we are going to be discussing this idea of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in order to be able to get there, there's a couple of things that I want us to understand about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, the, the first thing I want you to understand is that you were sealed and secure in faith in Jesus through the Holy Spirit when you were saved. So when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, okay, so if he's Lord of your life, you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit entered into your life at that moment, and you were sealed for the day of redemption. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He dwells within you, and so this is not what we're talking about. Christians are never commanded to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're never commanded to be secured, indwelt, or even baptized by the Holy Spirit. The only command directed to Christians regarding the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the Spirit. So what did Paul mean when he wrote this? I mean, think about it. This is a strange thing, right? If I were to say to you, okay, here we go. Here's a command from Jesus, from the Lord to you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Where would you begin? How would you know that you are being filled with the Holy Spirit? This is what I think it's important for us to talk about today. Because there's all kinds of language that we use within the Christian walk. And we throw it out there to people. And then we just kind of like drop it. It's like dropping a rock in somebody's uh, lap and just saying, okay, deal with it. Figure out what you're going to do with that thing. And so it's important for us to be able to explain these things. Now, we're told in numerous places that the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And here, I think, this is what Paul is talking about in our text. Stephen, for example, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Barnabas was said to be a man faithful and full of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, it says this, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So this is something other than the original indwelling that took place at Pentecost for them, or that takes place in the moment that any repentant sinner believes the gospel. So to say that so-and-so was filled with the Holy Spirit and rejoiced, or something of that nature, 
If we were talking about a Christian, that would be like saying, well, so-and-so has a nose, right? Like, there are these obvious things. Of course they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course the Holy Spirit is in their lives. If all Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit in the sense that he indwells us at salvation, then there's not much point for us to even make mention of it because it is an assumed thing within the Christian's life. It is a given. It's understood. So purposely mentioning this indicates that it means something else. These are people, or sorry, there are people around us that have strong influence in our lives. And we might use a term like full of so-and-so, and and then this is not usually language that we use, this is a little bit older language, but meaning that the person is so constantly thinking of this other individual that it permeates all different kinds of arenas of this person's life. And you could say that they are full of that person or that that person has a controlling influence in their lives. Now, Janet, for example, my wife Janet, has a controlling influence in my life. Not in a negative way, but and not even controlling by nature, but my love for her and my desire to please her controls a lot of the things that I think, a lot of the ways I behave, a lot of the decisions that I make and the goals that I have. So one could say that especially within my thought life and even in my actions, I am full of her influence. And this comes much closer to describing what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 5. When a believer is indwelt by the Spirit at conversion, that's entirely God's doing. It's a, it is the giving of life in most cases that the new believer doesn't even have the knowledge that this is really happening in the first place. I remember when I accepted Jesus. I was sitting down by a dock on a, at a lake at a Bible camp, and my counselor came down. He sat with me, and he asked if I wanted to accept Jesus. I accepted Jesus. I had no understanding of the Holy Spirit at this time. Now, looking back, I know that the Holy Spirit entered my life at that point. I was sealed. I was, I was secured by the Holy Spirit for my salvation. I know that. But in the moment, I didn't have a clue. But he was there. He was present. But Paul, in this conversation, the thing that he's talking about, and that's just something different. This is something that it, that the believer is at least a participant in. Notice that he doesn't say, pray daily for the Spirit to fill you. He doesn't say, wait on the Lord to fill you. This is actually more like a command in the believer's life to do, to partake in something. And so since it's a command, it can't be some kind of special uh, experience that is that is indescribable or that sort of thing. We are to pursue the filling of the Spirit continually and so we are continually filled with the spirit of god the holy spirit because of our pursuit of him now i want to go back to verse 18 in its entirety and then make some observations about it do not get drunk with on wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the holy spirit now paul uh, is probably dealing with this the way he did to address some present error and it's not unlike paul Paul will often use something that's going on in the lives of the people within the church to begin to highlight a spiritual point. So he uses a physical condition to highlight a spiritual point to get them to draw closer to the Lord. And so part of the worship in the temples of false gods was getting, falling down drunk. Like it's just people were out of their, out of their wits when, uh, when they were serving these pagan gods. And so when they become believers, they were probably coming out of some of these religions and bringing some of these practices into the church. And so then we're seeing this really irresponsible use of alcohol within the body of believers. People were just getting drunk. And Paul is saying, listen, don't do that. Don't get drunk with wine because it leads to all kinds of impure things. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul was not condemning wine as much as he was using it to illustrate the influence of the Spirit over our lives. Look, when when a person gets drunk, he's under the influence of alcohol. What is a DUI? Driving under the influence. That's a DUI. And, And so we understand that when we have these things in our lives, there is an influence that it has on us. When a man is filled with the Spirit, he is then under the influence of the Spirit. So how? 
How does this happen? How does one get filled, be filled with the Spirit? Well, I, I want to start with the closest parallel that we actually have in this passage. Paul, he uses this idea of don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, tell me, how do you get drunk with wine? Well, you drink it, and not just a little bit of it. You drink a lot of wine. And, and what you need to understand is that the wine in Paul's day was so weak that you would have to drink for hours to get this drunk, this idea of this highly uh, influenced state of being where it leads to the debauchery. So how, then, do we get drunk, filled with the Spirit? Well, I think Paul's parallel here is that we are to drink, that we are to drink lots of it. Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, for we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as from one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And listen to this. You ready? And we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Huh. Interesting. Uh, Jesus says in John 7, verse 37 to 39, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. And then in verse 39, it says, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him would later receive. Up until that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So how can you drink in the spirit, right? Because this is what we're talking about here. We're told that there's one spirit that we all drink of. Jesus is talking about let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And then we're going to have these, uh, these flowing water that comes from us. And he's re referencing the Holy Spirit in this. So how do we drink the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul says that those who are living according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. We drink the Spirit by setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. I mean, that makes good sense. So what does setting our mind on the things of the Spirit mean? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says this. Seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things that are above. And setting the mind on means seeking, directing your attention towards, being very concerned about, Philippians 3, 19, being devoted and taken up with. And so what could be said then is this. Drinking the Spirit means seeking the things of the Spirit. That's what it means. Not the things of the flesh, the things of the Spirit, to be filled. Directing your attention to those things of the Spirit, being fully devoted to the things of the Spirit. And so then you may even go out down this rabbit trail and say, okay, well, Rob, but what are the things of the Spirit? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit. And he was referring to his own spirit-inspired teachings in chapter 2, verse 13, about the thoughts and the ways and the plans of God, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. And so therefore, the things that are of the Spirit are the teachings about, of the apostles about God. Jesus also said, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, John chapter 6, verse 63. And so you could say that the teachings of Jesus are also the things of the Spirit. So drinking the Spirit means setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. And setting our minds on the things of the Spirit means directing our eager attention to the teaching of the apostles about God and to the words of Jesus. And if we do these things long enough, you ready? We can get drunk with the Spirit. Now, not drunk in, in, in terms of some... Uh, strange, you know, experience that some people speak of is really the idea that, that we get so enamored with the Holy Spirit that we just crave more and more and more, and then we are fully under the influence of the Spirit. And so instead of chemical dependency, we develop a wonderful spirit dependency. Christ calls us to be so consumed by him that we are lost in him. 
Now let's just quickly single out some phrases in this chapter so far from verse 1 to 18, which according to Paul would have us walking in victory of the Christian life. He says, be imitators of God in verse 1. Walk in love in verse 2. Walk as children of light in verse 8. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord in verse 10. Walk as wise, verse 15. Understand the will of the Lord, verse 17. And verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. And so the underlying message I think that we can see here is that, is that in order to do these things, there has to be a drawing near to Christ in order to imitate him, to learn what is pleasing to him, to understand what his will is, to emulate him and his love and light in our lives. And so really it's this idea then that I become less so that he becomes more. When we're talking about being filled with the Spirit, it really is less of me, more of him. When we get drunk, what happens there is that we lose inhibitions. What happens there is that we give ourselves over to something, and something else is now then in control of us. And that's a chemical thing, and it does things to our minds. And some people get to a place of euphoria. Some people get to a place of anger. Some people get to a place where we just don't know what's happening with them. But when we're talking about under the influence of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, less of me, more of him means that I become more like Jesus because I want more filling of the Holy Spirit. I, I am about the things of the Spirit. I am about the things that he is about. I become less so that he becomes more. And I think that that's the secret to being filled with the Spirit. Filled with the powerful, filled and powerful and equipped for service and relating significantly to the church. Because we lay self aside daily and invite him to fill us to overflow. You catch that? We, it is, again, it is even this language of dying to self. I will become less so that he will become more. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All of this stuff is this idea of being spirit filled. Less of us, more of him. More of his influence, less of mine. And if you're wondering what that looks like in a very practical sense, what are some of the effects of being filled with the Spirit? Ephesians chapter 5 continues on. And when we talk about the effects of being filled with the Spirit, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, it says this. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so the effects of being filled with the Spirit, one of those effects is fellowship. Paul says that the effect of being filled with the Spirit is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. And so Paul is talking about fellowship within corporate worship and that we should love to lift up the name of Jesus in song together. Look, being filled with the Spirit will give us a craving and a desire to be together with other believers. That's what it does. And it's because it's by this one spirit that we've all drunk. Being filled with the spirit leads us to a place of worship. Paul says that the effect of being filled with the spirit is to sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And singing may be a reference to the use of our voices in making music. And it may reference maybe even just using instruments. Whatever it is, that being filled with the Spirit brings us to a place of worship. Why? Because the more that the Spirit of God is moving in our lives, it becomes less of us, more of Him, and we'd be able to see more about what He is about, what He is doing. When we go out into nature and we look to the sky, we're able to see not just that the sky is beautiful, but that the hands of the ones who made it are. And we get to wonder about His creativity. We ask interesting questions. The effect of being filled with the Spirit is thankfulness. Paul says that the effect of being filled with the Spirit is always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many Christians complain all the time. We're going to talk about that kind of stuff in a series later on. 
But a spirit-filled believer is thankful for all that God is doing. So here's the challenge. In that area of your life, are you leading a spirit-filled life? Which do you do more? Do you complain or do you give thanks? Which has dominance in your life? And the way you answer that question should be a clue to you as to whether or not the Spirit is filling you in that area of your life, whether or not you are being filled with the Spirit or filled with self. Do you complain more or do you give thanks more? One of the effects of being filled with the Spirit is a heart of thankfulness. And another one here is that we will have submission from us towards others. Paul says that the effect of being filled with the Spirit is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So because I love Jesus, I'm going to submit to this person. Because I love Jesus, I'm going to seek their good above mine. Not that I ignore myself, but I really desire good for them. And I will submit. Now that's different, right? Believers who are filled with the Spirit listen to one another, serve one another, help one another. And we do that not because of who the other is. I love this because this passage, Ephesians 5, 21, leads right into the marriage relationship. And what I love about that is that I am called as a husband to submit to my wife in the ways that the Scripture tells me to submit to her, meaning that I will love her sacrificially and I will lead our home spiritually in a godly way. Why? Because that is what I'm called to. And it has nothing to do with Janet. Whether or not Janet is respectful of me has nothing to do with my call in my life from the Lord. Submit to one another. Why? Because they are worthy of being submitted to? It's not what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the Spirit-filled person reveres Christ. And the extent to which I revere Christ gives me the capacity to submit to others. Being spirit-filled is awesome. And we're called to be filled with the Spirit so that our lives can be fulfilled in a godly way and in a way that we could never imagine. So let me ask you this. Is the Holy Spirit in control of your life? Are you living a spirit-filled life? Are you seeking the things of the spirit to be spirit-filled? See, this is what we're called to. And when we live spirit-filled lives, his name is glorified. When we live spirit-filled lives, there is a humility, there is a love, there is a grace all of these wonderful things that we experience from God, we have a capacity to extend to others. And as we extend that to others, we become a contagious community. The church should be the first place people can turn for hope. And spirit-filled believers of everything else, offer hope. The reason that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin is not to make the world feel bad. It is to draw them to the heart of the Father. It is to draw them to salvation through Christ. And if we, being spirit-filled believers, become people who are so much about the things of the Spirit. And our desire is not to condemn the world, but to be part of what it means to save it. Not to condemn people who break things. Not condemn people who are broken and messed up in life. But to be a people who through compassion, kindness, patience, tolerance, help lead people to repentance. See, because that's God's model. That's what he does according to Romans. 
And the more we're about the Spirit, and the more we're about the things of the Spirit, the more like Jesus we become. Now imagine that. Becoming more like Jesus. I don't know if you've ever done the comparison, but the more I'm like Rob, I am a whole lot less like Jesus, which means I am less forgiving, less gracious, less kind. I'm less of a man. The more I'm like Jesus, the more I am all those things. And I get there by being filled with the Spirit continually. So who's in control of your life? You or the Spirit? What arenas of your life do you need to hand over more to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Understand this. The Holy Spirit is always present. And his desire is to conform you to the image of the Son. Are you living a Spirit-filled life? My hope and prayer is that all of us will so that we can show the world a much, much different story than what they think believers are all about. We will be more like Jesus. And in being more like Jesus, there will be greater expressions of love, greater expressions of compassion, greater expressions of grace, greater expressions of forgiveness. Doesn't that sound contagious? Doesn't that sound like the Jesus who stood with the woman caught in adultery, the woman at the well, the people who were in need of his miraculous healing? Doesn't it sound like the Jesus who calls to the tax collector and welcomes him into fellowship where, where his entire society would have rejected him? Doesn't that sound like the Jesus who welcomes a tax collector as one of his disciples, who is the author of one of the books of the Bible? The grace, forgiveness, love, and compassion of Jesus is so immense. And the more we be, we be spirit-filled, the more we become like Jesus. And the more we become like Jesus, the more contagious we are to a world in need of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together here talking about what it means to be spirit-filled. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that we will be a people who will surrender our wills to you. That it will be less of us, more of you. And as there is more of you, we become more and more like Jesus. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that your desire is to conform us to the image of the Son. May we be more like Jesus and less like us through your help, your guidance, your filling. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today for Church Online. I think it's amazing that we get to actually spend this time together. And I'm so glad that you decided to spend this time with us. We'll see you next time.